Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to be learning about the 2003 movie, The Last Samurai. To help us separate fact from fiction in the film, we'll be chatting with Dr. Brian Dirk, who is an author, historian, and professor at Anderson University. Before we connect with Dr. Dirk, though, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, for hundreds of years, Japan was isolated from the rest of the world. Number two, ninjas didn't wear black clothing like we see in the movie. Number three, the U.S. really did send military to train the early Imperial Japanese Army. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to chat with Dr. Brian Dirk about the historical accuracy of The Last Samurai. The Last Samurai isn't necessarily based on a true story in the same way that other movies that we've looked at, like Lincoln and The Conspirator. But let's start this by looking at the main character in the movie, Tom Cruise's version of Captain Nathan Algren of the U.S.'s 7th Cavalry Regiment. Was he based on a real person in history? Very loosely. I would capitalize the very on that, okay? The writers of this script were never entirely clear on this. Oh, I've seen several different versions of this. The theory is that they were based on a Frenchman named Jules Brenet. He actually was a French attache to the Japanese army. And kind of like in the movie, he got caught up in a samurai rebellion and the uh, Japanese civil war called the Boshin War. So he wasn't even involved in the rebellion in the movie. And they seem to have taken his story of you know a European who comes to train people militarily gets caught up in the conflict and sides with the traditional samurai. Uh, That's one theory. There's another theory that he also may be partially based on a couple of other Frenchmen who were kind of also tangentially involved. But, I mean, that's it. That's the closest you can get to historical reality. There were no Americans directly involved in anything that the movie depicts, the rebellion and all that. Okay. Okay. And and not to get too far ahead of the movie storyline where we're at here, but the person leading the revolt on the other side is Ken Watanabe's character, Katsumoto. Was he based on a real person at all? Yes, he was based on a samurai named uh, Saigo Takamori, who's a very famous man in Japanese history, who did, in fact, he based, it's really complicated, but he, he led the, uh, the restoration of the emperor, as the movie implies. He worked for the emperor and helped put the emperor back in a position of power during the Meiji Restoration, but he became very um, upset by the way that the new government was basically ending samurai rule, and he did lead a rebellion, as the movie suggests, and he did die in the last battle of that rebellion. So, yeah, in that sense, yes, everything else is really quite fictional. Okay. Okay. Now, early on in the movie, we do see Captain Algren get recruited by someone named Captain Bagley for a job with a Japanese man named Mr. Amura. We find out pretty quickly that Algren doesn't like Bagley because of something that happened during the Indian Wars, and we see some flashback scenes of, of chaos, but the movie doesn't really get too far into that. So can you give us a little more context around what happened during the Indian Wars that might have haunted a veteran like Algren? I thought that was one of the better parts of the movie, frankly. So yes, they weren't real specific about the actual incident. It was a series of flashbacks. Because in the movie, um, Algren is a Congressional Medal of Honor winner at the Battle of Gettysburg. Assuming that the uh, conflicts with Native tribes happened immediately after the Civil War, there were lots of those. The movie's never real clear which one that is, probably deliberately. you know, They didn't want to get too deeply into it. And then, of course, um, he's supposed to be a member of uh, Custer's famous 7th Cavalry who were slaughtered at the Battle of Little Bighorn, which is repeatedly referenced in the film. Custer himself was involved in the sorts of things that the movie depicts. American soldiers doing very bad things to Native American tribes, not being too terribly careful about whether they're punishing the right tribe or not. 
I think there's a line in the movie where uh, Tom Cruise's character says, these people had nothing to do with what we're punishing for and his op- the, the guy he hates that says, I don't care, and we're going to do it anyway. That was quite common. It was a famous wartime slaughter in uh, Colorado in which these are actually Colorado militiamen, not U.S. Army soldiers, who just came down and just slaughtered a group of peaceful Native Americans who actually had signed a treaty and weren't doing anything and slaughtered women and children and did really, really ugly, terrible things. So, I mean, I thought that part of the film was really well done. Um, Just in a series of flashbacks, it's not hard to imagine. And I've had to read some soldiers' accounts of soldiers rather like Algren in the film who were haunted by what they had seen and what they had done, what they'd gotten caught up in. The sense that I got from a lot of those flashbacks was it wasn't necessarily soldier against soldier, you know, military thing. It was like women and children and, you know, uh, just... Yeah, the big problem with the Plains Wars was finding the hostiles, you know, finding the the Native Americans because they were superlative guerrilla fighters, what we would call guerrilla fighting. They would swoop down, shoot up a train or whack out a settlement or take out a small squad of soldiers and then disappear into the plains. And the same thing happened that we see later in Vietnam. American soldiers grow increasingly frustrated. They can't find their enemy. They really, I mean, if you read soldiers' accounts during the war, they really even saw Indians. They, they, they were just long gone, you know. And when they did find Indians, they had a tendency not to be able to restrain that anger and that frustration. And it would boil over. And the sorts of things in that film that took place very much did take place. Just, just freaking out and just killing everybody they can find. The timeline of the movie starts in 1876, and it suggests that at this time, Japan is trying to pull in some Western experts to learn from them. They mentioned like lawyers from France, engineers from Germany, architects from Holland, and of course, uh, warriors from America, right? (laughs) Can you give a little more historical context around why this effort was going on to Westernize Japan and why it was needed at all? Well, let me just preface this by saying I realize I'm oversimplifying this okay or, well, otherwise this would be a hugely long podcast okay i mean i mean it would just even you'd be going okay we got another hour to go yeah okay no um it's really really complicated but the bottom line is this um japan had been a highly isolated culture for at least the previous couple hundred years um look at the geography it's an island you know i mean it's hard to get to anyway under the rule of the tokugawa tokugawa shogun these are the shoguns that ran the country they had imposed isolation. They had, they, you know, they had contact with some people, but most people couldn't go to Japan from other countries without permission. They really hadn't had much to do with the West at all. And then you get into the 19th century, and the Japanese are starting to be aware of, they, they, they've always had contact with the Dutch and the Portuguese, but then the Americans show up. Hey, how you doing? There's a guy named Matthew Perry. He is a commodore in the U.S. Navy and under orders from, from the president himself sails some warships into um, uh, Japan. I forget the exact year. I think it's 1854, maybe. Um, sails, sails in, drops anchor, has a lot of big guns, and says, you know, we don't really care for this isolation thing anymore, okay? Uh, we want to open trade. Uh, they also wanted to work, and, and this isn't as, quite as belligerent as it sounds because there have been cases of American whalers who had been um, stranded in storms on the shores of Japan and um, bad things had happened to them. And they were like, look, we want to protect our sailors here. We, we may have guys that wash up on your shore. We don't want them killed. OK, just can we, can we work this out? This was shocking to the Japanese because most of the gun technology and the ship technology, they're looking at Western tech and they're going, whoa, we need to do something about this because if we don't look up, we're going to look, look just like China. Because at this point, China had been carved up by all the colonial powers, the British, uh, the French, the Dutch. They had all carved spears of influence. China wasn't even a country anymore. And they were saying, man, if we're not careful and we don't westernize to a certain extent, we're going to be conquered the same way the Chinese are getting conquered. So there is this huge debate over whether Japan should westernize. And most people feel like some version of westernization is needed and how far do you go and there were some people who said well we just need to learn how to how they make these big guns but we're going to keep everything else but there were others who said look in for penny in for pound if you're going to learn all the tech you got to learn the culture around it or you're not going to understand any of it so japan is embracing westernization variety of modes but largely out of a sense of self-survival we got to become involved here okay because the world is not going to stay out look at this dude that just showed up in our harbor with a bunch of big guns we're not careful a bunch more guys are going to show up with a lot more big guns then what are we going to do 
you know. So yeah, there, there's a real push to do that. Yeah, and the film I thought actually did a really nice job. That one opening scene where uh, Algren's landing and that just crazy hustle and bustle of a Japanese port town. And, you know, you, you see Western stuff, you see Japanese stuff, and it's all kind of glommed together. And that's probably what that felt like in the 1870s. Now, one thing, when Algren does get there, he's called in to train an army of conscripts. And I think there's some dialogue where he mentions that oh, most of these are people are, are peasants who have never seen a gun. And then, of course, he's there to, to train them. And the way the kind of movie kind of puts it with the rebellion going on is, the, the ancient and the modern are at war for the soul of Japan. And then, of course, you know, the U.S. comes to help train. Was the U.S. actually involved in training the early makings of the Imperial Army? Barely. That's one of the major um, artistic licenses that the film took. Because you got to remember, in that time period, in uh, the mid-19th century, the United States was not really considered, even though we just fought a huge civil war, the United States was not considered sort of the creme de la creme of military technology, know-how, and training. It was the French, believe it or not, the French, you know, we don't think of them as a big military power, but they were. This is, Napoleon had just done his thing. And then the, uh, the, the, the Prussians, the Germans were considered to be the two countries that if you, if you needed to go learn how to do war stuff in a modern world, go to those guys. So they weren't doing much of anything with the United States. It was all Prussians and Frenchmen that were teaching and training these conscript armies. Now, you mentioned that Japan was isolated there, but were they keeping tabs on what was going on around the world to know that it was that to go to the Prussians, to know to go to the French, that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I almost hesitate to say that because that's the kind of common stereotype that Japan was a completely closed down country. And then all of a sudden, Perry shows up and boom, the walls fall. It wasn't that way at all. They did have contact with the outside world. And they did. Um, there had been, for example, a Dutch trade settlement near the port of Nagasaki all the way back to the 16th century. So they had had some limited contact with the Dutch. Um, they had some limited contact with uh, the Portuguese who were Roman Catholic, and they had uh, had some contact with Catholic missionaries trying to come to Japan to convert Japanese people to Christianity. So they knew about all of that. And they always had trade relations with the Koreans and uh, to the, with the Chinese, who in turn had connections with the Prussians and the French and all of that. So yeah, they weren't ignorant of the world. And there's, I would hate anybody to think that, okay, because they're isolated, they don't know what's going on. They got a really good idea. Now, they don't really understand nuances like the differences between a Catholic and a Protestant. That kind of throws them sometimes. But for the most part, they know which countries to go to. So, for example, you know, like they said at the beginning of the movie, they go to one country for one thing. One country, they, do, they do that quite well. They, 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 they figure out, okay, we want to go talk to the Germans because they know how to train our armies. We want to go talk to uh, the Dutch because of medical care. It turns out the Dutch had uh, really good doctors and they got medical technology and, and on and on and on. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because when you mentioned that, the first thing that popped in my head, you mentioned Korea. Of course, I'm going to think of some, a country like North Korea that is purposely isolated. And you think of, oh, well, they don't know anything about the outside world and that. Um, but it sounds like that wasn't the case at all. It's completely different. Not at all. They do have contact. It's just uh, the Shogun in particular was really concerned about too much Western contact, mostly because he didn't want the, the Japanese to turn into China and he didn't want Japan to turn into North America because rumors had gotten back to the shoguns all the way back into the 1500s of the nasty stuff that the Spanish were doing to the Native American Indians, you know, and, and the Dutch who are Protestants are, are egging that on. Man. It's like those, those damn Spaniards stay away from them because they're slaughtering the Incas and Aztecs. And they're like, dude, if we let these people in here, they're going to do that to us next. And who's to say it might not have happened, you know what I'm saying? I mean, because it could be that way, you know. Now, before we go too much further, as far as the movie is concerned, I do want to ask about the samurai from an overall perspective, because there are bits and pieces throughout the movie that talk about their history. And I got the sense from the film that the samurai were seen as the protectors of Japan. I think there's a line where Katsumoto comments that they protected Japan for over 900 years. Is that a pretty good description of what the samurai really were? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> One of the reasons this film had an ambivalent reception in Japan there are people who like this film in Japan because, as you know, it's a it's a highly, uh, one might argue, romanticized vision of Japanese culture in many respects. And there were people in Japan who said, man, finally, an American filmmaker actually wants to get to know us as opposed to just stereotype cardboard cutouts. So there's that. But there are a fair number of Japanese who reacted to that very thing you're talking about because – 
yes and no. The samurai had been the ruling warrior class of Japan all the way back to roughly the 800s. Okay, they had been running. They were the warrior, the warrior clan. Protecting? Yeah, in the sense that the two times that the Mongols tried to invade Japan, the samurai fought them off. You know, um, uh, two typhoons came in and killed them. It's a long story. But anyway, they did do that. On the other hand, the samurai ferociously fought among themselves for several hundred years and were not all that careful about things like loyalty and and, and all the, the things you associate with the samurai. That's almost a, a modern invention. The original samurai you know, would cut each other's throats, man. They were they were trying to grab domains. They were trying to grab power. They were trying to do this and that. A lot of the Japanese associate, not all, but a lot of the Japanese associate the samurai with treachery and with, with backstabbing and with pursuing a naked military and warrior power. You know, now at the same time, they're also highly admired. My point is, it's not a yes, no answer. It's highly ambivalent. Um, even today, I think a lot of people understand that the samurai were a lot more complex than that. Okay. Something else that we see in the movie there, though, is like another warrior class. I, I Maybe that's not the right term, but it would be the ninjas when they come in and, and attack. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see where I'm going with that, don't you? Yeah. yeah so <laughs> Well, I'm just curious, like what the structure there, you call them a warrior class. So then would ninjas almost be an, another warrior class or is that just a different way of fighting or what, what's the, what's the difference there as, as an ignorant American that doesn't understand? Well, I tell my kids this or somebody, they kind of groan and go, oh man, you know, cause everybody wants to have ninjas around. They're just too cool. Okay. I, I get it. Okay. I was, Hey, I'm a huge dark Knight series fan. Okay. The whole ninja thing in the first movie is like, dude, there we go. Okay. There may or may not even have been ninjas. Okay. There's a lot of argument over whether these people existed, but if they did exist, what they were were basically stealth assassins uh, employed by some samurai leaders against other samurai leaders who could infiltrate the opponent's castle, could infiltrate their town, and then by um, all kinds of activities, you know, swordsmanship was a small part, you know, a dagger, poison was a big one too could infiltrate and get somebody, okay? So that's what a ninja actually was, all right? They didn't wear the black clothing, okay? I mean, my God, can you imagine? I mean, you want to be a, a stealth assassin, but you're going to walk down the street and you might as well say, I'm a ninja, I'm a ninja <laughs> because you're wearing the black clothing, okay? But it's in every movie ever made. That whole thing is actually a creation of um, pop culture in many ways. A lot of the manga and anime and things in, in Japan and, and in the Western, we kind of picked up on that. That part of the movie, I, I cringed. I was like, guys, come on, man. You just make them into other samurai, dude. Let them, let them wear a kimono, whatever. Like, it's not that, okay? So, yeah, that part, although I love the sword fighting in that scene, I was like, not ninjas, man, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they they have their, their ninja uniform. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I wear a uniform. I'm an assassin. Everybody's going to know what I am. I'm going to do this anyway. So there we go. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I could see as watching the movie as, as a viewer, you have to be able to tell who's who. <laughs> I get it, you know, and you, you know, you know, Dan, we've we've done these interviews before, and it's like I get that movies have to do things, but that particular one, I was thinking that's an unforced error. Why, why do you have to drag that in here? Okay, I mean, Katsumoto is uh, about is people want to get him killed. Just have some guys come in and do it. Why do you have to dress them up like that? But that's Hollywood. I want to ask about the other side of this because. There is a scene in the movie where we see the American ambassador talking to Minister Omura and. He's talking about the contract for the U.S. to be the exclusive firearm supplier for Japan. Omura is very quick to point out that the English and the French would be happy to put forward an offer to be the exclusive supplier if the U.S. doesn't. So we kind of talked a little bit about the the Japanese side and and them reaching out to Western countries. But what about the other side? Were there a lot of countries that were looking to do deals with Japan now that they're now that they're open to trade? Yeah, and I should be clear, too, when I was pointing out that the Americans weren't involved in training much the Japanese armies, they were involved in selling arms to the Japanese, okay? So I'm going to make that distinction. They they were, I mean, you, the Civil War had just ended. There's literally warehouses full of American rifles. They were more than happy to sell them to the Japanese. So they, they were involved that way. So that particular scene is not bad at all, actually, because, yeah, I mean, the French, the English, other colonial powers are lining up to sell whatever the Japanese need. And arms would certainly have been among the list because that was in huge demand in Japan. They wanted Western firepower. Okay. And then I, I guess it, it could make sense that once once they have these, well, then we're going to have to have people come and, and train us how to use these. 
Sure, sure. But they would have gone to the French and the Prussians, though. They, they just they, they didn't go. In fact, the, the, the American army had a, a bad reputation at this point because they, everybody in Europe thought of the Civil War as a bunch of uh, American mob farm boys duking it out in the woods, not real experts. I mean, they really did. There wasn't this belief that the Civil War is going to produce the kind of experts that would give you an Nathan Algren to come over and talk, you know, good stuff to you. It just wasn't going to happen. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm curious about that, though. You, you talk about after the Civil War having a bunch of weapons and things like that. And something that is kind of a driver for Algren to go there is he needs money. And he's, I think in the very beginning, we see him, you know, basically he's doing ads for Winchester, right? He does these little performances. Was that sort of thing, those sort of performances common for veterans after the Civil War? Sure. I mean, I can't think of any specific things that look like that. But yeah, you've got a lot of veterans from the war. The one thing they didn't point out was after the Civil War was over, these huge armies, um, everybody was sent home. A man like Nathan Algren, if he had stayed in the in the military, and it's not real clear what his status is in the U.S. Army, really, in the in the movie. But, you know, if the people that were hanging on to their jobs in the army, by and large, were people that desperate for money. You could get a better job someplace else. They didn't pay well. And then once Appomattox happened and Lee surrendered, the overwhelming feeling was we're going to go home. So if Algren is still hanging around, it's probably because he doesn't have a job that can get him a living. And I think the movie kind of implies, he even says at one point, it seems the only thing that I'm suited for is suppressing tribal leaders. And I think that was a nice touch because it kind of says, yeah, if he's still in this game in 1876, He's probably somebody that's tried civilian life and didn't work out. As part of the attempt to defeat the revolting samurai, the movie shows Omura passing laws against them. Uh, the movie doesn't really explain the specifics of what the laws are, but we see soldiers in the streets harassing Nobutada and cutting off his top top knot of hair uh, simply because he's samurai. Were there really laws that were passed against the samurai like we see in the movie? Oh, yeah. When the emperor is restored to power and the westernization push is full-throated late 1860s. Now, I don't want to make this seem too neat. It took decades, okay? But once the emperors restored to power, they want to westernize. There was this sense that the samurai as a class, because remember, they were a hereditary class. This was not what came later in the 20th century when samurai culture was thought of as being Japanese culture. The samurai were a specific hereditary class who the feeling was had outlived their time. They were nice to have around when you've got civil wars, when they're, you know, when when you when you have wars to fight. But they had always had this ruling vibe where they ran the world. And there there was a real sense of they why do they have this? We don't need these guys having these kinds of privileges. I mean it wasn't just things like the top knot forbidden to wear swords in public. That was a huge deal because the swords were the symbol of samurai Samurai power, the samurai were restricted in because uh, you know you go back a couple hundred years. A samurai, if a peasant looked at a samurai funny, he'd find himself headless in about ten seconds flat. Well, samurai couldn't do that anymore. You can't dispense your own form of justice here. I mean, things like that. So yeah, it was yeah that was very realistic. The bent that the movie put on it was it was tragic. You know that, that poor kid, he's just trying to preserve his culture and look what they're doing to him. Which I'm sure that was true, but there was also a sense of. These guys have been pushing us around for a long time, and it's about time things got even out. You mentioned swords, and I wanted because there's, there's there's kind of a, a concept that the movie pushes forward that the samurai were against using modern technology and their weapons and such. I think there's even a point where uh, one of the I can't remember who it was that says it, but he he, men- he mentions that Katsumoto refuses to be dishonored by using guns. Was that? That push towards modern technology, modern as far as the 1870s were concerned, you know, guns and, and things like that, was that something that the samurai really resisted that hard? No, the movie got that totally wrong. They really did. The firearms had been in Japan at least back to the 16th century. And in fact, there's some evidence that they had some more primitive Chinese firearms all the way back in the 15th century. But like, the samurai are practical warriors, okay? I mean, the samurai are trying to kill people and not get killed. It's a whole lot better to kill somebody when they're 100 yards away with an arquebus or a musket than have to get up on them with a three-foot-long razor blade. I mean, these are, these are practical men. No, they very much embrace firearms. And in fact, 
the man who eventually establishes the Tokugawa shogunate, which was for 200 years, Tokugawa Iyasu did so, at least in part, and, and, and his, his predecessors, at least in part, they all were all very good at acquiring firearms and employing them more effectively than the people they were trying to conquer. So the movie really got that, that badly wrong. There was a scholar who wrote a study here about 30, 40 years ago who claimed that, and he had ended up just misreading some scripts that seemed to claim that, but not. No, the samurai didn't have a problem with firearms. They used them all the time. Okay. Yeah. I, I really got the sense that it was old versus new and, you know, new technology of, of firearms and stuff was something that they were fighting against, but that. No, the only reason Saigo Takamori didn't have guns is he couldn't get any. I mean, and, and, in, and in real life, the rebellion that he led one was a siege of a castle, and then a couple more battles. I, I believe he had firearms. I think I, you know it was. It, it looked like a nineteenth-century battle, although they also had swords at the same time. Throughout the movie, there are numerous mentions and depictions of seppuku, and as movie explains it, it's the act of restoring your honor by taking your own life, and it's a concept that seems totally foreign to an American like Algren. Can you explain a little bit more about that and how it fit into the culture? Well, I'd, I'd prefer not to commit seppuku. I don't know about you. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not pro seppuku. Okay, very, very much. Okay. And thank you for saying seppuku, not hirakiri, which is a much more vulgar version of it. Okay, yeah. Seppuku uh, actually dates way back into the medieval Japanese period. The idea being that to preserve your honor, you take your own life. Or there are a lot of different origin stories here, but one origin story was a samurai warrior who's about to be uh, conquered by his enemies, decided to kill himself rather than be taken captive. And he chose purposely to do it in a very painful way. I mean, if you cut across your gut, that's going to really hurt. But the thinking was, this is the honorable way to die because you're not dying to escape pain. You're dying in the worst painful way possible to preserve your honor. So there's that. Ordering someone to commit suicide uh, has a very long history in, in samurai culture going back for hundreds of years. When I, th I think of that, the f kind of the first thing that comes to mind would be in World War II, you see that, you know, the kamikaze pilots and things like that. Was that a similar concept? I got a bit, Dan, I'm not an expert on World War II. I, you know, Civil War is my main thing in the 19th century. Um, so the kamikaze, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to presume to speak to their, their motives. But um, from what I know of them, there was this sense of honorable sacrifice in battle. That was kind of my point. Yeah, that, that, the idea of, of honorable death. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, don't, I can totally see that connection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I got to you know, growing up as a Midwestern white kid and reading stories about Japanese kamikaze charges in World War II and, and committing, you know, seppuku and all that, my, my sense was, well, these people are nuts, you know. But as I've, as I've learned more about Japanese culture, um, I, 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 I'm not saying I think it's a good idea, but I understand it. You know, I understand the thinking behind it a little bit better than I used to. And, I, and you know, it's, it's all about appreciating another culture in a lot of ways. In the movie, there is a point where we actually get to see the emperor, and I think uh, Algren and some of the ambassadors go to see him. And the idea that I got there was it's very, very uncommon for foreigners to be able to see the emperor. Was that really the case? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, the movie kind of pushed the edge of plausibility there. We have to remember, the Japanese emperor is considered to be descendant literally from a god okay um now i'm not talking about divine right monarchy in europe which is you know you have god and the king is the vicar of god you know god says the king enforces the belief was that the emperor was literally god uh, a god one of one of many but uh, a god if you go far enough back you know so you know there was a long-standing thinking that you don't get an audience with the emperor unless it's extremely special. And if for that matter, even the Shoguns, um, if, you, if you saw the Shogun and had a personal audience, that was an extraordinarily high honor. You mentioned earlier the battle in the, in the real revolt, and there is a big battle towards the end of the movie where the samurai and, and the Imperial Army of Japan fight, and it's swords against guns, old versus new, right? Uh, can you give a little more context around what really happened in those battles? The real Sako Takamori, who had been disillusioned with the emperor um, embracing Western ways more than he had wanted, led a rebellion that didn't do, go well. Not real clear what exactly he was planning to do. I don't think he, he was not going to overthrow the emperor. One does not overthrow the Japanese emperor. Okay? You don't do that, okay? But I think he wanted to march on uh, Tokyo and overthrow some of uh, the emperor's evil advisors, okay? Um, he actually didn't want to lead a rebellion. He had established a, uh, a school for young men to learn traditional samurai ways. And the movie does get that right. Uh, the original Psycho Takamori is a samurai traditionalist. 
He really doesn't want to westernize very far. Um, he thinks things have gone way too far. And he trains these, these young men are trained in this tradition. They start the rebellion. They, they start, you know, they, they gather an army and, and talk about marching on Tokyo. And then he decides to join them. And there are some people who think that he didn't even really want to do this. He just figured he had to. They try to lay siege to a castle along the way, one of the supporters of the government. And they get really bogged down in this castle, they're in the siege, because sieges take forever. The truth is, the real Psycho Takamori, a brave man standing for his traditional samurai values, he's not that successful a field commander, because he, he should not have let himself get bogged down. Because when he gets bogged down, the superior forces for the emperor are able to come up drive him away from the castle he's retreating he fights a couple of battles and then i guess sort of what was like the movies battle he's kind of cornered he can't go any place he knows, he knows this whole thing's going to end some accounts have him um charging into the mouths of the cannon of the imperial army the way the movie depicts only waving a sword to sort of die an honorable death in the movie we do hear some dialogue where they mention that the word samurai means to serve and Katsumoto believes that his rebellion is actually in service of the emperor. Do we know if the motivations behind that were like what the movie implies? I'd say yes to an extent. It's really complicated, okay? Sago Takamori or Katsumoto, whoever, you know, remained loyal, believed himself to be loyal to the emperor's sort of true interest. And the, the, we, again, we have to speculate. Psycho Takamori didn't leave a lot of documentation. He didn't keep a diary that I know of or I've ever heard of. It's all secondhand accounts. But what he seems to have believed was evil advisors, like in the movie, you kind of get the impression in the movie, evil advisors were taking the emperor way too far down the path of westernization. It, that, that, okay, let's go get some guns. Let's go learn their tech. But my God, let's not, let's not eradicate the samurai as a class. That is Japan. Okay. So there's a belief that the emperor had been led astray and we're going to go back, take out those advisors and then lead the emperor back on the true path of where he should be, if that makes sense. But you know what? The, the truth is as well, this is not all that. It's not just noble like that. There was also a lot of just resentment. These are samurai that are, that are, that are losing their privileges, man. They're Because uh, the government, among other things, um, eradicated their pensions. Up until this point, the samurai, as a ruling warrior class, received pensions from the government to, to live on. Because they weren't allowed, before the Meiji Restoration, they were not allowed to be farmers. And they were not allowed to be merchants. They had to be one of the only samurai. And the only way you could do that is you had to, somebody had to, you had to put food in your bellies. You had to live and the government subsidized that. Well, the subsidies were coming to an end and they were really mad about that. They were like, you're taking my money away. What the heck? You know, I mean, you know, so it wasn't just noble defense of samurai culture. It was that. OK, but it was also just some real re resentment that our privileges are being suddenly and painfully erased. OK, similar to what we were talking about earlier with, with the concept of Algren, you know, as, as a vet. Can't go back to civilian life because this is all that I know, that similar type concept, right? Yeah, I tell you what, the, the movie that I always think of when I watch this movie is um, Dances with Wolves, because there's many similarities. If you go back and look at it. It's the same basic story arc. Disillusioned, you know, white American officer encounters in a radically different way of life that where he finds true meaning in his life. I mean, that's, that's Kevin Costner in a nutshell in Dances with Wolves. I really see that when I see this film. I'm curious about there, there was a, a little conversation between Katsumoto and Algren where he asks if Algren is the general in the army, right? And and Algren says, no, he is a captain. And, and then Katsumoto asks, is that, a, is that a low rank? Like he doesn't understand what a captain is, which... You know, it could make sense that he wouldn't understand the ins and outs of the American army in the 1870s. But in this very same conversation, just like moments before, he says, uh, you know, we're both students of war. Which one is it, right? Yeah. Is, would it be crazy to assume that he would not know what a captain is? You know what? I find that hard to believe. I think the, the movie wants to depict um, Katsumoto as sort of a um, wise tribal leader that you know has his own ways that he's keeping that's fine and everything but i find it i would find it really difficult to believe that he wouldn't even have a cursory knowledge of the ranking system of a western army after all he had originally supported the uh, the emperor in um in trying to westernize in military tech uh very likely he had to have met some frenchmen and uh, germans who knew what a captain was so they were kind of pushing that just a little far
was there a similar sort of ranking system in the samurai like like you would see in an army or is it not necessarily like generals and captains and you know leaders and that kind of thing well i, I think it probably depends on which era you're talking about you know there was a pretty complex ranking system of greater and lesser samurai uh there were the the, the so-called daimyo which were um basically the head samurai of a domain and then they would have advisors and they would have names and they have other advisors and they would have names and then there there was certainly a ranking level among the samurai of people that were closer or further away from the shogun as a matter of fact the shogun had won his office and reunited japan at a battle called sekigahara and uh, there was a ranking system after that the samurai who had supported him before Sekigahara were ranked higher because they were seen to be more loyal. The people who supported him only after he won that battle were seen as opportunists and they were pushed further away. So there was definitely a hierarchy there. It just wasn't, I don't think it was quite as rigid as a Western army system. There's another scene in the movie I wanted to ask you about, and this is when they're, when they're training. Algren is training with Ujio and, and, I think it's raining out and they're using these long wo- wooden sticks instead of swords, but it's extremely physical <laughs> to the point of where, you know, he's taking his legs out. Uji is taking his legs out and, you know, hitting him in the gut and even hitting him alongside the head with the stick. How well did the movie do showing this, the, the training? Well, to tell you the truth, I like it. I, you know what? Some of the stuff might have been pushing it just a little much. Okay. Um, but just, and this is my kendo background, you know, um, a samurai would not train with a real sword. It's a three foot long razor blade, one wrong move, and you don't have a training partner anymore. Okay, not a good idea. Okay, so they developed these uh, wooden wooden training swords called bokuto, which is what they were using in the film. And the idea was, most of the time when you were training, you didn't actually strike your opponent. You would be learning. Okay, if I'm on a battlefield and this dude comes after me with a headshot, I do this, this, this. And they had literally hundreds of scenario called kata that would show you what to do in a certain situation. Uh, that said, I have seen references in some swordsmanship schools where they did strike, not not full blows like the shoot, the movie. But for example, I've read that you could tell a fencing teacher in Japan because they would always have these calcified knots on their wrists where they got popped so many times that it, it screwed their wrist up. So yeah, you you could get hit. But I'm telling you, the movie push that a little too far. You don't want to get hit with the bulk dough like that, okay? You probably won't get back up. It's like your brain to the baseball bat, okay? I mean, in the movie, I was kind of like, dude, if he had actually leveled Tom Cruise like that, Tom Cruise has made his last Mission Impossible movie, okay? Because it ain't going to happen after that, you know? So, yeah, I thought that was a little much. Although, on the other hand, I really thought they were very careful about the swordsmanship scenes in an impressive way. They really were. And it looked like he hit him pretty hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we are, but you know, they had kendo at that point. Kendo's with the uh, the body armor that we wear and the shinai. That was actually invented in the late 18th century. But if they were traditional samurai, they would have trained with the bokuto and they would have been striking, just not full force. But they would they would have been they would have been probably smacking each other a bit when they were training with these things. Along the same lines with with training, the the timeline of that, I think it uh, starts with Algren getting captured and he says, you know, winter is coming. It doesn't give specific dates or anything, you know, months or anything like that. But you get the idea that winter is coming. In the beginning, Algren is just getting beat. Like, he, you know, he, he doesn't know how to fight like this. And then by this time spring rolls around, Algren is able to come to a draw with Uchio. It would it be even possible to train over a few months to get to a point to where you could fight as well as a samurai? I've read that Tom Cruise wanted to make this movie very badly, and he personally trained for a year in basic techniques of kendo, iaido, and kenjutsu to, to be able to film the movie. So there's that. He couldn't do that. Okay, It was one of the more suspension of disbelief aspects of this movie that, I mean, the timeline's indistinct, but it was only months, right? Since the time he's captured in battle, the time he comes back, what, four or five months? And I mean, dude, he can fight like a just absolutely serious. And on top of that, he masters the third hardest language in the world. Okay. I mean, trust me, I'm preparing for this trip to Japan and I'm trying to learn just the rudiments of Japanese. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, and he's like, that that guy was a savant. Okay. I mean, I would love to have his language skills. So no, they, no, from my experience, you know, doing kendo, I mean, I'm frankly, I'm not a natural at it. I have to work really hard at it. But after 14 years of practicing kendo, 
Um, I'm, I'm the equivalent of a third degree black belt. I worked awfully hard to get there. And he was doing stuff that I, I don't think you could do after you've been practicing for a decade, frankly. Okay. Yeah. That was something that I thought m- they might have pushed the timeline just a little bit. <laughs> a little much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the very end of the movie, we do see what happens with the treaty that will make the U.S. the sole firearm supplier for Japan. After Algren shows up, the emperor ends up, he turns down the treaty, but he decides that, yes, Japan needs to modernize, but we cannot forget where we came from. How well did the movie do showing this ending as the movie implies, you know, the end of the samurai and, and modernization and all that? It's a movie, you know, they have to give you a, a kind of a neat ending, you know what I'm saying? It's a two hour or two and a half hour movie. You got to tie it all off. And I get why they did that, but the reality was far different and far messier. Really, the emperor went rather the opposite. Um, he fully embraced westernization. And in fact, from about the 1870s till at least the early part of the 20th century, there was a mania for westernization in Japanese culture. It wasn't just the empire. For example, um, I've read that um, there was a mania for Western poetry and Western literature to the expense of traditional Japanese poetry and traditional Japanese literature. You know, there was there was this general sense in the population that traditional Japanese ways were backwards and the West was, um, especially science and technology, were forwards. And if you are if you are embracing the old things, then you are somehow a fuddy-duddy, you know, that kind of thing. That would change um, in the early 20th century um, when uh, Imperial Japan began to sort of embrace their version of samurai values as a way to unite the population and build Japanese nationalism. But at the end of the 19th century, it's a very messy process that you couldn't... I, I got why they did it in the movie, because I don't know how you'd put that in a movie. It was just, it was a very complicated thing. Okay. Speaking of something I'm, I'm sure is going to be very complicated as well, if we look at the movie overall, kind of the, the concept is, you know, we, we talked about it somewhere, um, Japan is, is this isolated country, and so when Algren comes, it's just you know, culture shock to him. And then we get a little bit of that the other way. We talked a, a little bit there with um, you know, Katsumoto, maybe not understanding what a captain is, you know, but we see some of that culture shock you know, from the other, the other side as well. What are some of the key cultural differences between the U.S. and Japan that like – did the movie, I guess, do a good job kind of picking out some of those cultural differences or were there other ones that might be some, what you'd consider a key difference that they might come across? Yeah, I thought I actually did a fairly decent job with that. I mean, again, it's a vastly more complicated thing than that. Um, and I'd, I'd, I'd hate to exaggerate the boundaries too much. Of course, the Japanese were aware of quite a few Western Western isms, you know, they they had had contact with the Dutch for over two centuries. They knew the Spanish, not nearly so much contact with the United States um, for for various reasons. I mean, for one thing, the U.S. really wasn't a world power until after World War, after the Civil War. So, you know, they, they you know you, they they hardly met very many people from the United States, and the United States didn't much matter to most people until after the Civil War. Anyway, we're a backwards provincial place, that kind of thing. Um, so if you want to just kind of go down the line, I, the Japanese don't have a very good concept of like uh, the U- U.S. government structure. They don't really have a real understanding of our politics. As I pointed out earlier, it was still hard for the Japanese to kind of grasp uh, the differences between a Protestant and a Catholic because they have a very, very different religious structure that's rooted in uh, traditional Shinto and Buddhism. I mean, it's I mean, you're really mixing oil and water there, you know. So, the, the, yeah, the Japanese had very uh, – most of Matsumoto's – or Katsumoto's uh, questioning of um, – I'm sorry. Matsumoto's questioning of, um, of Dahlgren or Algren are, are right. I mean, he would have been – he would have not known. Maybe he would have known about captains and stuff, but there's a lot of things he would not have understood. Um, I actually thought they did a fine job of Algren's encounter with Japanese culture. You know, live, living in a traditional Japanese place – um, you know, he's housed with a, a woman and he goes to help her and he doesn't understand the men don't do that kind of thing in the Japanese culture, you know. So I, overall, yeah, in terms of those personal relationships, uh, yeah, there was, there was contact. They, they knew of the, um, of the United States, of course. There had actually been a mission to the United States in 1860 of a delegation of Japanese that traveled to Washington, D.C. to sign the treaty that Perry had begun in 1854. And, of course, they'd met some Americans then, but that was really rare. It was just, it was very unusual for a Japanese person to have been to America and actually seen anything and vice versa. Okay. 
that movie doesn't really mention this, but I'm just thinking of it from being in the U.S. today, where uh, we are seen at you know, especially you know, after World War II, we are kind of seen as the 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 military power, right? And so, with the movie obviously being created after that, I could see how they would just want to make it seem like the U.S. was the like the culture as far as the U.S. in the movie is post <laughs> World War Two, po- post this this aspect as opposed to the way it was. Yeah, yeah, you know that's a very good point actually. You know because they kind of behave in the movie as if the United States is this very powerful nation that they now need to be reckoning with. To an extent, that's true. It's not entirely untrue, but really the French and the Prussians and the European powers who are steadily colonizing into you know, modern-day Indonesia, colonizing East Asia, they're much more of a threat to the Japanese and everybody else than the United States at this point. That's a good point. At that point in the 1870s, had the U.S. started colonizing a lot? I mean, obviously not near, nearly as much as like the French and the British. No, no, you're, that's a great point because the, no, we didn't. We didn't really have colonies to speak of until the 1890s in the Spanish American War, when we get the Philippines, and you know we get. Um, I think is that when we get Guam? I think we get several islands in the Pacific, um, and that kind of thing. We we sort of embraced the imperial shtick um, right around the turn of the 20th century. I'm not aware right offhand of any direct colonies we had in the 1870s, other than the contiguous United States. And Alaska, of course, is purchased at about this point, you know, but that's about it. We're not really a, a, a colonial power yet. But, you know, the Japanese had every reason to fear that we would become one. And again, what scares them is, is China. China is a sad story at this point. It's not a unified country. It's been ruthlessly exploited by the European powers. And the Japanese, who always had a heavy connection to the Chinese, were like, oh, my God, we don't want to end up like them. You know, we're, we're, we just, we've just been occupied by a country with more technology and superior firearms. Okay, that, that makes sense, being there right next to China and seeing what's happening to them. That's one reason why the, the Japanese in the early 20th century um, end up occupying Korea, because they're really concerned that they need Korea as a buffer state between them and China. And it's not a pleasant occupation either at all, you know, but the, 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 a lot of what you see in the Japanese in the early 20th century especially is a completely understandable worry about powers like the United States with all this technology basically conquering them and they've never been conquered oh okay let's say you were directing this movie what uh w- what's something maybe maybe a, a lot of some things but what's one big thing <laughs> that you would have uh changed i just i don't know i would have i would have liked to have seen them make make matsumoto a bit more of an ambivalent character you know because the real psycho takamori is more ambivalent it would have been nice if they could have been just a little more gray area-ish about this and point out that Psycho Takamori is protecting his his interests as a samurai as well as preserving a traditional culture. That that this isn't that he's not he's not a nobleman fighting the good fight and going down swinging. He's got an interest in this that's maybe not so altruistic. And then I and, and then I would have it would have been nice if they had taken Algren and actually turned him into some kind of Frenchman or something resembling what actually happened. Okay. I get it. You've got to market to an American audience with movies, especially in 2003. I couldn't help but think if this had been a Netflix prestige series like we have now, that would have been two or three seasons long, and they might actually have been able to do a better job with the multiple people involved. Because, like I said, there's more than one French officer who gets involved in this. It's actually a fascinating story. I, I just A two and a half hour movie is not going to do this justice. Thank you so much for your time to come on to chat about The Last Samurai. For someone listening to this who wants to learn more uh, about your work, can you share a little bit about your books and, and where they can get them? Like I said, I'm not I'm not an expert on Japanese history at all. I'm a, I'm a U.S. historian, but my expertise is the Civil War era, and uh, especially Abraham Lincoln. And um, I've written quite a bit on a We're on a first-hand basis now because I've written a few books. Okay? But uh, my latest book is uh, The Black Heavens, Abraham Lincoln and Death. And um, I'm looking at roughly the same period as The Last Samurai and looking at how Lincoln processed issues of death and dying during the war. Great. Thanks again so much for your time, Brian. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Dr. Brian Dirk for sharing his expertise about the historical accuracy of 2003's The Last Samurai. As he mentioned at the end there, Dr. Dirk's focus in history is actually the era around the Civil War, so the same time as the movie we looked at today. 
If you want to learn more about his work, I'd recommend picking up your own copy of his great books like Lincoln and the Constitution and The Black Heavens, Lincoln and Death. You can find links to his books on the show's home on the web based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, for hundreds of years, Japan was isolated from the rest of the world. Number two, ninjas didn't really wear black clothing like we see in the movie. Number three, the U.S. really did send military to train the early Imperial Japanese army. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one. For hundreds of years, Japan was isolated from the rest of the world. That is true. As Dr. Dirk explained, for a long time, Japan had been largely isolated from the rest of the world. That's not to say that they weren't aware of what was going on in the rest of the world, but they largely rejected a lot of contact with other countries up until the 19th century. That's when they started to realize they might run the risk of being conquered by a more technologically advanced country. So that ushered in the westernization of Japan. That brings us to number two. Ninjas didn't wear black clothing like we see in the movie. That is also true. Dr. Dirk pointed out that, for one, we're not even sure if ninjas even existed, but even if they did exist, they wouldn't be wearing the sort of black uniform that we see them wearing in a lot of movies. After all, their purpose was to be clandestine, and you do that by blending in with those around you, not wearing a ninja uniform. That means number three is the lie. The U.S. really did send military to train the early Imperial Japanese Army. Dr. Dirk pointed out that in the 1870s, when the movie takes place, the United States wasn't seen as the world power that it is today. Instead, it was the French who the Japanese turned to, since this was about the same time as the Napoleonic Wars across Europe. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I like to do on each episode is to share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. I know that's not something that most podcasts do, and that's exactly why I'm sharing this information. If there's one thing that is surprising to most people who are new to podcasting or who have never created a podcast before, it's just how much time goes into creating them. So I figure maybe if you find out more about how much time and money goes into creating podcasts like mine, then maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 31 hours to create and cost $14.21 in out-of-pocket expenses. As I always do, I want to make it clear that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. In other words, that 31 hours does not include the countless hours of my guest time researching the subject matter we talked about. It also doesn't include the time it takes for me to do podcast-related things that are not a part of creating this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain the Based on a True Story website, uh, social media, the email newsletter, and all those other little things outside creating a single podcast episode that are still required to make a podcast overall. Similarly, on the expenses side, that $14.21 is just for things specifically for this one episode. It does not include all the podcast-related expenses that go beyond making a single episode. For example, the cost of the microphone I'm talking into right now, the cables hooked up to the microphone, the audio interface, the computer, the software, all the podcasts and website hosting costs, and on and on. All those things take time to set up and maintain and cost money that goes beyond things associated with this one episode. But they're all things that are required because if I didn't do those things, there wouldn't be any episodes of Based on a True Story at all. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard in this episode. You can find more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they are not the only ones who are helping to keep the show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping to support the next episode over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support as a bonus you'll get access to the producer's feed which as of this recording has over 65 exclusive minisodes as well as ad-free versions of the regular episodes like this one so if you prefer a version of this without the ads you can find out how to get access to all of that by supporting the show over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support once again, that's based on the true story podcast.com slash support. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon.